Hello everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, we've got quite a packed agenda today. Um, so it's really, um, each one of these meetings like tends to take a lot longer than um, it would do if we're in person. Um, so it's really important um, that we keep um, everybody keeps their microphones on mute when you're not speaking. Um, if public attendees can uh, turn your video off at the same time um, and preferably if, if members do that as well, um, because we'll get a, a better quality of image. Not that that's necessary in some cases, but um, if we um, if 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 there are people trying to speak out of turn uh, for members of the public, the um, or or members. Uh, Officers will just cut you off, um, but obviously everybody's got a point, and we've got. Um, and this, this is I'm really um, happy actually that this this topic has been raised at this exact time because we've got the the opportunity to make some real change at the moment, um, and we've got some fantastic speakers um, and people doing presentations. And as an added bonus, we've got Rob Pickering from the British Cycling Campaign, and he's um, attending today in his personal capacity. Um, so I'll just go around the room, uh, so to speak, um, and I'll try to do it off the iPad with people that are here at the moment, but excuse me if I haven't mentioned you, um, it's probably a good opportunity if everybody um, tells each other who they are, um, and at the same time we can do declarations of interest. Um, so we can go around um, the lobby, which I'll do now, um, and I'll start with... So, uh, James Fallon. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah, perfectly, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I, I'm just a, a Winsford resident interested in seeing what's happening at the meetings. Um, I'm really concerned about the climate crisis, so that's why I'm interested in attending. Oh, thank, thank you for coming. Cheers. Um, Kathy Harrington. Hi, I'm a member of the 20s Plenty for Chester and Chester Cycling Campaign and a great supporter of active travel and all things green. So that's why I'm wanting to attend. Thank you. Cheers. Um, uh, Morgan Jones. Hi, I'm Strategy and Innovation Manager at the Council. I'm here to support the meeting and this project. Thank you. Um, Sean Trainer. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Sean Trainer, Head of Highways and Transportation at Chester Western Chester Council. Um, Rob Pickering. Hi, yeah, good evening. Um, Rob Pickering, I'm the lead for British Cycling in the north of England, and I'm also a resident of Chester. Thank you. Um, George Ablett. Good evening, everyone. I'm George Ablett. I'm the uh, Energy and Carbon Reduction Officer at Quest Services. Um, Richard Skitt. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Richard Skitt from Mont McDonald, and we are working with Sean Trainer on the A56 Hall Road Corridor study. Uh, Andrew Lewis. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Lewis. And I'm Chief Executive of uh, Chester Council. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bowers. Hello, I'm Councillor Paul Bowers, Ward Councillor for Hellsby and member of the Green Party. Uh, Councillor Watson. The microphone might be muted. Councillor or Colin? Uh, Councillor Watson. Hi, I'm Elton Watson. I'm Councillor David Moulton Ward and Kingsmead. I'm here as a visiting member. Uh, Lawrence Ainsworth. Good evening, everyone. Lawrence Ainsworth. I'm a director at the council here to support the meeting. Uh, Councillor Holbrook. Uh, Jill Hogwark, I'm a councillor for Upton. Um, I'm here as a member of the committee and also I think Chairman you said I have got no declarations of interest to make. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Shaw. Can't hear you, Karen. I'll introduce you, and I don't. I don't think you've got any declarations of interest. Uh, Karen, Karen's our cabinet member for the environment. Uh, Colin Watson. Colin Watson, um, member of the Climate Advisory Panel. Brilliant. Um, Gillette, Councillor Jill Edwards. Hello. I'm Gillian Edwards, council, Ward Councillor for Weaver and Cuddington. Um, my declarations will be the Weaver and Trust and Weaver and Parish Council. Thank you. Cheers, Jill. Um, Danny Crump. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Danny Crump. I'm Director of Urbanism from a, a design company called Rotary Malian. I'm working with uh, Sean on the Cool Road Corridor Study, and I am a bit around placemaking and streets specialist. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Eardley. Um, Councillor Simon Eardley, a member for Sorghum and Wallington. Thank you. Um, Georgina Patel. Hello, everybody. I'm um, Georgina Patel. Energy and Carbon Reduction Manager for the Council's Joint Ventures at Quest Services. Thank you. Um, Stephen Perry? Well, Stephen said his mic isn't working. Um, he's a member of the public who wishes to observe the meeting. Oh, okay, great. Um, Richard Beecham's on the phone, but he is listening. Two ears, but he's got two ears. The, um, Catherine Green? Hello, I'm Catherine Green. I'm a pedestrian and cyclist and resident of Chester. I'm a member of many green groups, including um, um, being a CAPOD climate champion. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Um, Will Pearson. Hi there, I'm Will Pearson. Um, I'm a strategy and innovation manager at Cheshire West Council and I support the climate emergency programme. Thank you. And finally, Arnold Wilkes. You can't find his unmute bit button. Arnold is a local uh, campaigner and he has been for years and he's got his fingers in a, a lot of environmental pies and good, good all round vote. Um, so we'll move on to the next um, agenda item, which will be public questions. Um, so this is in no particular order. Um, this will be based on the um, when people submit their questions. So the first one will be from Colin Watson from the Chester Sustainability Forum, and that's um, a statement relating to the Anthesis data um, and transport targets. Um, I have had the privilege of seeing this, and I've, I've done a similar thing personally myself. Um, and this, uh, uh, we'll, we'll um, listen to what Colin's got to say. Can I, can I ask you to keep it less than three minutes each, because we've got four speakers. Um, so that will be 12 minutes in total. Um, so, yeah, go for it, Colin. Certainly. Thanks, Matt. Um, Chair, officers and members, uh, I'm Colin Watson, a member of the Climate Emergency Advisory Panel. Thank you for letting me speak this evening and thanks to everyone in the Council that has been involved in the pandemic response. Uh, for me, the borough feels a safe place to live in these difficult times. Thank you. Final figures for the impact of the virus on CO2 emissions have yet to be produced but many estimates indicate that they are in the order of what we need to achieve annually if we are to meet our CO2 targets moving forward. This demonstrates the urgency and the difficulty of that task ahead of us. Let us not forget that the Tyndall Centre advises that fossil fuels should have no role in, role in our energy systems after 2035, and the Anthesis report asks us to make a reduction of 70% in our carbon emissions by 2030. You may forgive me a little exaggeration in observing that this is just over nine years away. I've recently spent some time on the emphasis report and specifically the transport section. It reads for 2030, total car usage down by 27%, commuting by active travel 
no target set, but emphasis source data suggests a doubling of current values. Public transport journeys up from 10% to 20%. Freight emissions is set at 98% of current, which is a curious number, which does not decrease much by 2050, when I understand the freight industry has committed to becoming carbon neutral. I think this needs reviewing. Electric cars up from not a lot to 75% of cars on our roads. Electric buses up from not a lot to 76% of total buses on our roads. And last but not least, electric trains up to 100% of total trains on our rails. My question is, to meet our carbon targets, we need clear accountability and reporting against these targets. How is the task force going to agree accountability and reduction strategies with each of the major players in the areas identified by Anthesis? Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Colin. Um, we'll get a written um, answer back to you. Um, Will is responsible for our, um, uh, for our key performance in indicators, so that will form a part of it. But I think it's probably it'll probably take a bit too long to 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 explain that over the um, in a two hour meeting, which will probably be a bit longer. Um, so our second speaker will be Catherine Green um, with a question related to the Northgate car park. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to pay tribute to the council for all you've done during the pandemic. No rough sleepers in our shop doorways. The public informed as to how they both could give or receive help. Hubs established for the collection and distribution of essential supplies. Support and PPE provided to care homes. You councillors know better than me and officers how this list goes on and on. You've recognised the pandemic as an emergency and you've acted like it's an emergency. Thank you. I hope you won't reminding me why you're here as a climate change task force. You're here because the council declared a climate emergency. In October 2018, the IPCC said the world had 12 years to stop catastrophic climate change. That 12 years is now down to 10 and a half years. The ice caps are melting, polar bears are drowning, the snow is falling as frozen rain on the tundra, so the reindeer are starving. Pacific islands are becoming inundated with seawater, so the land is becoming useless for growing food. Disease-bearing mosquitoes are spreading to new habitats. Coral reefs are bleaching, koala bears and firefighters in the Australian bush are burning to death. Last summer, our moorlands burned, and this year our crops are affected by both floods and now a prolonged lack of rain. But we know this, we're the climate task force, you say. I'm saying this because although the climate emergency may seem far away, we have to be acting like our house is on fire now. When the pandemic was far away in China, it was easy to deny the prospect that it was going to hit us. We laughed and sang happy birthday while we washed our hands, but it was incongruous with the horrors to come. So coming to the Northgate development, I believe it's incongruous for the council to declare a climate emergency and then say it needs to build a new 800 space car park to regenerate Chester. This car park is, in, is needed apparently to balance the costs of the Northgate development and attract people to Chester. This seems to be incongruous with the chief exec's report to the council in January, which said that by 2025, we need to see a 25% reduction in car travel. When did regeneration come to mean using carbon generating steel and concrete so that climate changing cars could drive into and park more prettily in our city centre? Why can't regeneration and re revitalisation mean renewing the earth, bringing a greener space? The Eden Project, Tatton Park, Delamere Forest, Japanese Cherry Blossom Festivals all show outdoor facilities attract people and the green tourist dollar carries some weight. A 13 day holiday to the United States to see the spectacular autumn colours with Nature Trek costs £3,400 for 13 days, but flights are currently no longer available. Catherine, sorry, you've had three minutes. Um, if you want to wind it up, please. Um, Oscar nominating films are re being released, director streaming. Um, 
people are flocking to open air attractions. Chester's got a prime, which could provide an amazing green carbon negative tourist attraction. I plead with you as a climate task force to take your responsibility seriously, act like your house is on fire, require that the Northgate scheme is reassessed against its carbon impact and more climate friendly alternatives. My question is, how can you justify building a 70 million pound car park when you've declared a climate emergency? Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll get a written response um, to you. Um, next speaker is Pierre. Uh, well, three uh, with a statement relating to active travel. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak at this meeting. Uh, tonight I will be speaking on behalf of Extension Rebellion Cheshire. As some of you may know, as some of you may know, sorry, we have been carrying actions in Chester to draw the attention to the climate and biodiversity breakdown we are facing. Given that I have only three minutes, rather than speaking on specific issues of which there are many, I wanted to instead highlight four general principles I think and we think uh, should be the backbone of uh, the Council's actions in relation to uh, the climate biodiversity breakdown and also in particular active travel. You've got to, see, you've got to stick to the transport and active travel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the first principle is Please be bold and ambitious. This is an emergency. Chester West and Chester needs to rise up to the challenges arising from COVID and climate breakdown, not manage micro um, manage micromanage incremental changes. We need to urgently prepare for the post personal car era. Changes need to happen now, not in five years' time. Do not allow allow car centered all thinking to cloud decision making. Second, make cycling and active travel a permanent focus of policy making at Chester West and Chester. Plans, including the current uh, local walking action cycling plans, have a beginning and an, and an end. What the people in Chester West and Chester need is for active travel to become to permanently inform decision making, in particular, but not only uh, in areas such as housing development. Only this will enable the long term thinking that we desperately need. Do you, we all remember this question asked by British uh, policymakers to the Dutch one, how can, how can we get to your situation? And the Dutch policymaker replying, start in 1975. That's what we need. The third principle is put women at the center of any cycling and active travel strategy. First of all, because women are in overwhelmingly in charge of the short journeys that are done by car uh, that we want to turn into active travel journeys, going to the shops, the school run, <laughs> but also uh, because women play a larger role in communities and uh, could help uh, reinforce uh, permanently uh, cycling in communities. And finally, the last, the fourth and last one, please, inspire and show the, the example to the people in Chester West and Chester. Councillors and public figures should routinely, routinely themselves use active travel and nudge their staff and stakeholders to do the same as much as possible. You all have this uh, image of the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte visiting the King in Den Haag on his, on his bicycle. Why don't we do things like that in Chester? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre. That's that was a great, um, and you've got a lot of the important points there that we've uh, brought up by the officers. Thanks very much, um, and they'll get back to you by reply. Um, we've got a fourth and final speaker, Ashley um, McRite. Sorry, I probably pronounced that wrong. Uh, I don't actually know if Ashley's uh, joined us in the meeting just uh, just yet. Oh, okay. Um, well, we'll move on then to consider um, the report which uh, is being presented by Georgian, Georgina Patel. Um, she's the lead at Q West Services for Carbon Reduction. Hello, everybody. I'll just um, share the um, report. Hopefully, you'll be able to see this. Brian, is that okay on screen? Okay, so I'll just start yeah, off. Just... 
Right, thank you. I'll um, just start off. The, thank you for inviting me back to the task force meeting. Um, this is a subject area that's uh, cropped up at the last two meetings um, regarding solar PV and Salix for schools. Um, so apologies if it sounds a bit like repeat. So um, the Energy and Carbon Reduction Team at Quest Services were requested by the Climate Emergency Task Force to look at uh, the council support for solar uh, PV on schools and other public buildings. Um, and as a result of that, the Energy and Carbon Reduction Team have produced a full report, an advisory report on activity to date and the next steps. And I, um, the full report, advisory report, has been appended to the minutes. So um, I'll start off by going through the work that we've completed in relation to solar PV to date. We're not starting from a standing start. Solar PV installations on schools, on the school estate, started back in 2011. Uh, and completions include a total of uh, 42 schools, 39 primary and four and three high schools. Um, we've installed solar PV also on Wyvern House and Northgate Arena. We've worked with Chester Community Energy um, on installing solar PV on Northgate Arena and more recently Christopher Leisure Centre in Leicester also. Solar PV has also been installed on uh, the major projects of Story House, Barons Key and Northwich Memorial Court and those um, PV installations were funded um, through the cost of the, the whole project. Um, all of the um, solar PV schemes on schools and council buildings benefited from the feed-in tariff at the time, um, which supported the financial case for investment. Um, we're not in a fortunate position at the moment uh, now because the feed-in tariff ended um, and then that has a big impact in terms of financial case of these installations. Um, Salix funding uh, has been available to local authorities and public sector organisations. Um, it's provided by BASE, the Department of Business and Energy and Industrial Strategy, and it's available to councils to use across the whole of the local authority estates, subject to um, a payback period. It's normally around five years, a longer period for boiler, installation of boilers and for schools the payback period is eight years. It's also subject to um, lifetime um, CO2 savings as well in terms of eligible schemes. Salix so does fund over 100 energy efficiency technologies, um, included boi including boilers, um, CHP systems, insulation, um, LED and other lighting upgrades. Um, the council have used it to date mainly to fund solar PV, LED lighting in schools and council buildings and the biggest project that we've um, undertaken to with SAIX funding is the street lighting programme as well. And so we've used uh, as a council, we've been using SAIX since 2010 um, and we've applied for individual um, funds uh, on a project by project basis. So what can we do moving forward? Um, there's a cycling, a savings recycling fund that's available. It's recently changed its name to the savings decarbonisation fund. This is a ring fence fund um, with capital provided by Felix and matched by the partner organisation. It's the, save, the financial savings delivered by the programme where the projects involved are recycled, recycled into the fund, allowing further spend for other schemes. And if you're dealing with these energy efficiency measures as a program of works rather than individual projects, then the payback period can increase up to 10 years. Um, based on other organisations utilising the Salix Recycling Fund, um, Salix are reporting that the average payback period they're seeing is about three and, three and a half years. 
Um, the size of the fund varies between 100,000 to over a million pounds. Again, the Salix report that a typical size fund would be around half a million pounds. Uh, in total, we say it's providing half to 50 and the organisation match funding the other half. Um, in terms of local authority areas, it's not just used for council buildings, it can be uh, used for this on this car parks, council offices, leisure, libraries, museum galleries, and much more is the whole local authority estate. So in terms of the report, um, the key recommendations are for solar in particular is for it to be considered um, as a primary consideration for all roof works that's including uh, where roofs are renewed or, or being um, renovated. Desktop surveys for all schools to pr and prioritise a list for solar investment potential for those schools. There is a total of 225 schools in Cheshire West and that includes all types of schools. Um, for 150 of those are maintained schools and we've already installed measures, solar PV and LED lighting in 42 of those schools already. So we would recommend a detailed sur survey of the remaining um, local authority schools, that's 100 schools, over the next year, year and a half, using provision in the climate emergency revenue budgets. We're recommending to set up a Salix Recycling Fund for eligible schemes across the Cheshire West and Chester Estate public sector estates um, and utilising the half a million pounds of the 2020-2021 capital programme climate emergency budget for that um, and looking for that to be matched by Salix loan by a further half a million to create a, a one million pound recycling fund going forward for investment in all eligible schemes. And Quest Services is um, ready and able to, as the council's joint venture, uh, able to deliver all of those um, initial surveys and uh, project delivery of those um, installations too. Any questions? That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Georgina. That's uh, really comprehensive and um, that's a good good outcome because I think that's um, it meets the cross-party consensus of what was was asked for. Um, my only, um, like maybe a, a fifth recommendation, the only one that I would be thinking of would be whether or not we could increase that even further if it was the right thing to do. So perhaps if it was um, created um, initially we that this can be on an ongoing basis to try and to try and bump this up even further and obviously uh, work with as many um, uh, partners as we can to try and reduce the um, cost cost on the council has anybody else got any questions um i'm meant to have a few screens on the screen um so if you can raise your hand um or just switch your camera on and wave your hand uh, but if you press on the three little dots on your screen um it should show up that there's a hand waving um so if anybody wants to ask Georgina a question please go for it no silence is golden <laughs> we have discussed it over the last two tasks before so i think all the questions have been asked already yeah thank you thank you very much thank you. cheers thanks it's uh, also uh, just if I could quick, quickly make a point, Chair. Uh, it's Will Pearson here. Um, it's yeah. worth mentioning that uh, that we will, of course, um, take this through Office of, Office of Governance. Um, the the report was actually uh, you know produced obviously on the, both the recommendation of the task force uh, and also driven uh, through by by Charlie Seward. So we'll take this through the um, Climate Program Board uh, and also the the Capital uh, Capital Group as well. Um, so that's the kind of next steps for this report. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I've, I've, I missed two things out on the uh, the agenda. Um, I need somebody to forward and second the minutes of the last meeting, um, if that's possible. Paul Bowers and Jill. Absolutely, yeah. And and I'll, I'll second them, Chairman. Brilliant. Um, if I could ask um, Andrew Lewis, our chief executive, to um, give us a brief update on our um progress made with the climate advisory panel um that would be great thank you 
Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. Happy to do to do that. Um, I mean, actually, you're about to hear a couple of the presentations that were already made to the to the advisory group. So uh, I don't want to steal their thunder by by summarising what they they said. Um, suffice to say, the the advisory group was was uh, very engaged in that question about uh, sustainable transport. How do we make use of the um, opportunity that arises now because uh, many of our transport networks are are underused during the pandemic, um, but also for the longer term, take a very different approach to our uh, highways and open spaces to see them as uh, community spaces rather than uh, purely uh, in order to uh, allow internal combustion engines to to travel around, often in congested environments. Uh, and you'll hear later during this meeting um, some of the really exciting opportunities that arise particularly for Chester, given the, um, uh, the, the, the um, uh, transport challenges that we, we have in that particular city, um, but applicable not just around the borough, but um, around the country as well. Uh, we also heard from, from Rob that you'll be hearing from later from, the, from British Cycling, and uh, uh, the advisory panel was really enthusiastic to explore how we could take forward the uh, cycling and walking strategy, for Cheshire West and Chester and enable new opportunities for better connections for people to walk and cycle around rather than to take the car, particularly for short distances. Um, and there was a particular discussion about the opportunity on the Hull Road corridor, which I think, again, you'll hear about uh, later today. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, Chair, if that's if that's a helpful update. Uh, the advisory group um, operates alongside the task force. Uh, to go into more depth on some of the particularly technical issues that arise in um, uh, determining our response to the climate emergency. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And the next item on the agenda will be... Excuse me, my uh, devices have switched. Um, we'll be receiving an update from Sean Trainer, who's our new senior manager for, for infrastructure and highways. Um, and this this will be particularly interesting because this will be how we um, approach um, the opportunities presented um, at the moment and how we how we deal with this as a council. If you're there, Sean. No, if Sean's not there. Oh, oh, there we go. Apologies, sorry, just uh, no, trying sorry. to get a present presentation <laughs> up for you. Um, is that is that visible? It is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay. Um, so yeah, thanks, Chair, for for inviting me along. I'll I'll do a, a brief introduction here um, and which will be followed up by colleagues from Mott McDonald and Broadway, Broadway Mallion um, as, as well. So in terms of what I wanted to provide was just a, a bit of a scene setting for baseline analysis here. Um, so to provide a, a few statistics um, just to introduce this, this session. So this is data from the Department for Transport. It was published in 2019 and it, it's actually for 2017-18, so there's a bit of a backlog in, in reporting. Um, but this is, the first one is is all cycling. So I just want a, a bit of perspective that when you look at the, the bright green to the left of the three columns, that's Cheshire West and Chester, relative to a Northwest average and an England average. So I just want to, from a all cycling perspective, that's not to be complacent at all, um, but to make a point that it's a it's a good receptive starting point, I would suggest, um, to the cycling agenda. The next slide, which I just put up there, breaks that down a little bit into cycling for leisure and then cycling for, for travel. And, and by cycling for travel, that means, in my world, sort of traveling for commuting purposes. I think the distinction to make here is you'll see that the, the difference between Cheshire West and the Northwest and the England average is much greater for cycling for leisure um, and I think that the challenge or the opportunity for for me in terms of cycling ambition is that almost that travelling for commuting does need to be our focus 
I, I think from a speaking as a traditional highways engineer, the cycling for leisure are generally the easier bits to do. Um, and we often fail at the difficult, more challenging highway intersections. And I think that's probably borne out and it, it does influence cycling behaviour. So a, a bit of a stark admission from me, from me there. Um, in terms of similar baseline analysis for walking, um, not as stark a difference there. And you'll see on a monthly basis, weekly basis, we're a bit higher for all walking activities. But when it gets down to more frequent walking, um, three days per week or at least five times per week, we are we are lower certainly than the England average average there. And then again, walking for leisure. Um, it's probably flipped a little bit here. There's probably more walking for for commuting um, travel here, at least on a sort of weekly or monthly basis. So just a bit of an introduction in terms of statistics there. And I don't want to move on to the local and medium long-term strategy. So again, just to, to present a focus here. So we have consulted um, on a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan um, that ran from December through to February. Um, and we are planning to finalise that and seek approval by Cabinet in the summer um, 2020, so not, not too far away now. So just thank everyone for their input in, in that over 600 comments um, and representations were made. Were made. Um, so that sort of boosts walking and cycling levels, and I've just set out there by creating infrastructure, taking advantage of future um, funding resources, um, providing best opportunities, Make cycling and walking a priority for the council. I think that responds to some of the earlier comments um, and provide high level feasibility and indicative costs. Um, so this is the type of output that's, that was in the draft um, LC WIP. It did have a concentration on our economic centres of Chester, Ellesmere, Port Nest and Winsford North, which Frodsham and Helsby. And it makes recommendations for cycling and walking by those prioritised locations. Just an indicative map there for Chester. So plans are included, and then is a supporting narrative together with a strategic assessment that includes environmental considerations. You won't be able to see read this, but effectively it gives us a guide to the ones that are tick more of the boxes, and we might prioritise prioritise those. And I think Chester was the top one, and Ellesmere Port was probably the most green. Those those two. Also, in terms of national sort of medium long-term strategy the government has recently announced that it's going to renew its uh, cycling and walking investment strategy so it's looking to publish publish that in the in the summer um the sum of its current strategy um targets there as well which is talking about doubling cycling and increasing walking um, by 2025 so a bit of context there and then a recent publication, which I think I mentioned at a, a previous meeting, Decarbonising Transport, Setting the Challenge. So this is a recent um, government publication, which is asking lots of questions, not necessarily the answers here, and it welcomes interaction and feedback. Uh, so it's maybe something that the uh, task force might want to formalise a response to that before it publishes its decarbonisation plan later in 2020. There was a series of workshops and visits, I'm not quite sure how they'll pan out virtually, I, I now assume. And I what I really want to turn to quickly before handing over to, to colleagues is what the immediate opportunity is. And again, some of the questions there was was based on the immediate challenge here. So on the 9th of May, um, Secretary of State announced a two billion package to support active travel um, to help the country emerge from the current crisis. Reference the first stage of 250 million talked about emergency interventions to make cycling and walking um, safer. We're yet to receive any allocation for that. I've checked in with Department for Transport over the last couple of days. I believe it's due any day now. So fingers crossed this this week we'll get to hear what allocation, if any, we, we get from that. As Andrew mentioned, there's been a dramatic dramatic fall in traffic volumes across the border. These trends have, have also led to congestion almost being eliminated and significant drop in pollution, at least in the early days of lockdown. Um, traffic is getting back out there now, unfortunately. Um, and the council is looking to identify the potential for a range of temporary pop-up measures. We are looking at an imminent, announce, an imminent announcement on, on this. We're just currently developing a, an online tool. So we've had lots of stakeholder feedback already. We want to broaden that to the 
but are wired, as Andrew says. Um, and that image there is something that um, Stockport and Transport for Greater Manchester were able to do. We can drop pins and make suggestions for what that activity is. In the meantime, until we, we get that up in a few days and run in, there is a, an email that, that suggestions can be, can be made to. Happy to share that after the meeting as well. So that was it for me, Chair, um, just to thank you and any, any questions, whether you want to take them later. That's brilliant. No, uh, that would be, I think this is probably going to be quite a uh, popular subject with people wanting to talk about. Um, it, um, any questions? Uh, yeah, I've got one if it's possible. Yeah, sure. Hi, Sean. Um, is the correlation with the low use, is there a correlation with the high engagement in cycling and low use of public transport uh, and also commensurate on, on private car journeys? Um, if, are we higher for cycling, what I'm saying, because less people use public tri transport? The, there's certainly a correlation and we've got a challenge in, as you know, public, public transport challenges, particularly in the bus network, um, is a particular decline there. So I think you're right, that's in, in all the cities which have got better public transport, you're right, you, you might get a, a, um, some less car use or, or some less active travel use, but you would like to think you get less car use, that's the aim. Here. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Obviously, you know, to encourage as much uh, active travel as possible, but yeah. integrated with public transport, you know, I'm particularly thinking about, you know, uh, how difficult it often is to get bikes on short train journeys around yeah. here. Yeah. And, and certainly not on buses and so on, no. you know, to, to link up would certainly be, uh, uh, yeah. you know, encourage us to get cars off the road. They would. And I think the biggest challenge as well for the public transport industry is just confidence on use now. Um, will people be comfortable and feel safe um, with social distances on buses and trains? Um, I think that's the greatest opportunity for active travel to fill that void. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, go ahead, Jill. Please, sorry. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, doors. I was just gonna, just going to ask, with regards to the infrastructure plan um, that will be finalised shortly, um, I had a few conversations with around this at the end of last year because there's um, a route in my ward that would be ideal um, to connect to two um, areas. One particularly is... Um, a substantial new build housing um, estate. Um, but what happens if that, say, in that instance, that route isn't identified in the plan? Are there yeah. still options whereby we can progress it, especially with the recent situation we found ourselves in? Yeah, most definitely. So any suggestions we're, we're open to at the moment, that sort of email um, address that I shared, any, any thoughts, um, like so. When we get the uh, allocation, fingers crossed for that in the next couple of days, we'll be able to uh, to invest that quickly and promptly. Brilliant. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holbrook. Thank, thanks, Chairman. Um, Sean, with the work that you've done so far, have you um, taken into account <clears throat> the proximity of wards to the centre of the say business area shopping areas that they apply to for example you know people living in round chester in for example hall and newton or yeah. upton are perhaps more likely to work walk into chester than somebody living in silver and mollington or because or further out in vickers cross so are, yeah. are have, have those figures been amalgamated in the information that you have provided uh, and what difference have they made yeah the, they have been considered for the um for the <laughs> Um, LC WIP, so the, the long, the medium to long term strategy. Because what, again, what we don't want to do is that sort of perverse outcome that because you've got more cycling now in in areas that you get the next level of investments. That's certainly what we've sought to to avoid there and try and try and sort of um, level the agenda somewhat. So those sort of the key corridors into the urban centres are the ones that we're trying to connect to so you don't need to jump in your car to, to get those journeys so yeah the, the point you're making is is taken into account um and councillor early um yeah thanks um sean um, you mentioned the um the government uh, paper um decarbonizing transport I, I didn't quite catch whether you said that we would be making a submission um and if if there aren't any plans 
uh, will we and who will yeah. um, take a lead on on doing that please yeah thanks uh, I think it was a suggestion for me that the, the task force textiles is an action for for it to make a submission I'm I'm happy to to help draft draft that or, or make a draft version um, for consideration if that's helpful yeah I don't think anybody would be in disagreement with that thank you brilliant um i've got what kind of timeline are we looking at to actually get stuff sorted for the temporary stuff um sean because soon sooner or later everything, everything will yeah. have turned back to normal um, and also what considerations um are we have we um, or lobbying actions have we made to get um trial for electric scooters yeah I should so, declare an interest there because I've got one. And it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a, a couple of things on that, and Andrew might might come in and support this. I think we're looking to get something out on the ground in the next in the next week um, at the latest to get some some pop up schemes out there. We've got a long list um, at the moment, um, just from a few inquiries that have been made, but a really positive, engaging list. Um, willing to receive more, but yeah, certainly in the next week. We'll, we'll, we'll look into get some some actions out there in terms of the mobile uh, the e-scooters. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a positive change from government. Uh, they were looking at a, a small number of select trial areas. Now I think we're just pushing it an open door. We just need to put our hands up. And yeah. So yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll work as one of those areas. So yeah, we'll follow that's that it. up. Yeah, because not not everybody can cycle, um, and they're very and not everybody can afford an electric car uh, or no. or charge one even if they could. Um, yeah. And certainly at the other end of a, a, a bus journey, eventually when all this um, disappears, and it's incredibly practical. Yeah, just a just a bit of again the urgency there, and why we want to do this in the next few days or week, is that the, the data that I did look at, I think when we were in deep COVID lockdown, traffic flows were down at fifteen percent of um, traditional flows. A week or so ago, they're back up to fifty percent. In the afternoon peak, the morning peak's still down significantly, but the afternoon peak's back up at 50%. So, yeah, we do need to act quickly. Brilliant. No, th thank you very much. And um, I think it'd probably be good if you could send a, a member briefing because I've been sent pro probably 15 emails about this exact subject over the past week. So, um, yeah. and I'm sure other members have as well. Um, so, if a, a briefing could be prepared as to what the um, the yeah. council's planning to do. Um, that'd be that'd be brilliant. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Sean. Um, next item is well, it's always bang on 1850 as well. Um, which is from uh, Richard Skitt and Danny Crump. So thank you very much. Um, this is um, a presentation on the uh, Broadway approach to sustainable transport for our communities. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so this is a brief presentation about the Streets for All initiative. And um, this is work that we've been engaged on by Transport for Greater Manchester, but we are now looking to implement this wider, both the principles of it and the outcomes. Briefly, in terms of the agenda here, my colleague Danny will talk about Streets for All, what it actually is in terms of both a concept and a project. And then I'm going to briefly run through what we intend to do in terms of the A56 Hall Road Corridor study and some of the work we've done thus far in terms of exploring solutions. Can jump on, Danny. Why now? Clearly, climate emergency has been declared by the council, rightly so. We've got a health crisis nationally. It may vary across the country, but no area is immune. Appropriate transport infrastructure is seen as key as supporting sustainable economic growth. Sustainability gets mentioned as a key word often in the um, in the planning system quite regularly and perhaps only truly realised by this approach. Behavioural change towards sustainable modes, the only way to achieve key targets. And lastly, but perhaps in some ways most importantly now, um, as terrible as it has been, COVID-19 presents an opportunity to change demands and meet demands in a different way. 
Next slide, Danny. So my colleague Danny will now talk to you a little bit about what Streets Fall actually is. I just need to unmute my microphone. OK, so hopefully we're back into the presentation there. So, um, yes, what is Streets for All? Well, it is a movement for equitable streets. Uh, this is very much not an anti-car rhetoric. We're not saying ban all cars, but we're saying let's share the streets more equally across the modes. We think that streets can be more than conduits for vehicles, that they can be places for people. And our project work on Streets for All, uh, for who we were engaged by, uh, Transport for Greater Manchester, starts with uh, the high level strategy for uh, Greater Manchester, which is around a vision to create one of the best places to grow up, get on and grow old. And from that flows the transport strategy 2040 with a number of key aims, many of which you wouldn't necessarily think to find in a, in a transport strategy. So it's about protecting the environment. It's about creating and supporting sustainable economic growth. It's about improving quality of life for all. And so there's a big inclusivity piece here as well and it's about developing a city region that is this is innovative in its approach there are a number of regional initiatives uh, flow out of the transport strategy part of that is around public health as, as Richard uh, already mentioned our inactive crisis uh, issues of congestion and, and clean air which are affecting many places in the UK uh, an agenda and a movement to uh, encourage cycling and, and walking, certainly in Greater Manchester. A look at future mobility and how that might impact on our lives and our streets. In Greater Manchester, bus reform, uh, you know, buses are a big part of, of the solution in the, in the long term. And Greater Manchester Spatial fr Framework guides uh, development in, in Greater Manchester and, and our streets uh, inform and impact on that growth. A number of pilot studies were moved forward by TFGM and we looked at the orbital study, which is the blue line and the pink line you can see there to the north of Greater Manchester, a study area of 54 linear miles. And we felt that there's quite a few similar dynamics to some of the issues um, between Greater Manchester and Chester. So high car dependence, uh, struggling local centres due to issues of uh, severance. A poor quality public realm, so a, a big problem with place, uh, and actually perceptions of place being quite low, so arrival and, and gateway and, and dwell uh, being quite poor in many um, areas along that corridor. So this is how we approached the Streets for All project and, and some of our findings. We started with a, a yardstick and we measure our success on whether a 12-year-old could safely navigate the street that we've designed. And this 12-year-old represents a pensioner or a parent or somebody with mobility issues. So it's a good measure of success. We approached it from a movement and place perspective, and this is really important to success. So this is a measure of any given street uh, against its uh, importance from a, from a movement perspective and also its importance from a place perspective. And traditionally, movement and place have been dealt with quite separately. So transport engineers looking at bus projects, walking projects, and landscape architects looking at public realm and green infrastructure schemes. So what we did is we approached it, uh, we brought movement and place together, and we had transport planners and urban planners really looking at streets and places as a holistic piece. The process was, was very much a co-design led uh, process, and you know, engagement was really important. We really found out some vital information from those that we spoke to. So uh, we, we, we engaged with officers, obviously, but we also spoke to, to leaders and portfolio holders. And, and we also met with local members and local members gave, gave great insights uh, into uh, local issues, as you, as you would imagine, but also had a really uh, positive uh, and global outlook and were, were very supportive of this work. Important that you understand your streets. There's no uh, one size fits all. So we did a lot of baseline uh, assessment. Part of that was about uh, using all the modes to visit the streets, so the corridor, uh, and understand how it changes through the, through the day and the night. And it's not just about moving, it's about stopping as well. And that was an important recognition in this project. So some of the key issues and opportunities then. Our key issues were around high car use and dependency. 
uh, and that was impacting on congestion and air quality. Uh, space on uh, the corridor is limited, so we can't build out of the congestion. There's no space left, so an alternative solution is required. But currently, the alternative modes are unattractive, so limited cycling infrastructure uh, and walking gets you know, very little attention. Uh, the street was highly engineered after years of focus around cars, so place and public realm very much an afterthought. And a lot of hostile pedestrian environments, so severance was a real issue. Uh, safety hotspots were an issue and, and guardrails, the default response to some of that. So in, in response to those issues, then our opportunities were around rebalancing the street. So think about how cars and people uh, and uh, bicycles and, and other modes can share that, that cross section of space and really try to encourage people out of their vehicles onto different types of mode. De-engineer the character of the streets and create streets where people wanted to spend time. And actually think about streets as, as healthy, inclusive and accessible spaces where communities can come together. But to do that, short trips are really important and short trips generate quite a lot of car travel. So if we can get short trips to be on uh, walking or cycling, that's a real positive. And again, just coming back to stakeholders. So as co-designers helping through the process to understand the issues and to come up with the solutions. So we defined a set uh, of recommendations and, and a vision. And that was around a connected city region. So reallocating space to people on foot, cycles and public transport and reducing traffic volumes and speeds. We wanted to create special environments on our streets. So heritage rich, locally referenced, very distinct and vibrant places. And for those streets to be safe and green and resilient to change and vital at the moment. And we wanted to create socially rich spaces. So as I mentioned before, streets as places to enjoy not something you see too often uh, outside of outside of London or some of the central areas in our cities, and but responsive to local needs. It's really important that they're not um, uh, that, that we are responding to what's what locals want, and to create active, safe, and healthy streets for all. We defined a set of street types or, or typologies, so different types of uh, streets that you would find on that corridor, and you can see them here. There's seven seven of them. And to those streets, we assigned, or we recognised, I suppose you'd say, existing characteristics around how they work, how they function, and what some of the issues are. And the next step then was to set some guiding principles. So these are our recommendations for how we can address those issues and how we can start to create streets for all. We then tested those guidelines in discrete locations along the corridor. Uh, here you can see a uh, junction in, in Bury. Uh, and on the right hand side, a matrix which sets out the guiding principles and then a rag rating, red, amber, green rating about whether it's a street or not and some commentary on, on that. Those proposals were then tested against Healthy Streets Matrix, which is a, a, a national set of recommendations and guidelines um, initiated by TfL. Uh, and um, a, a nice, easy set of indicators that especially the public can, can grasp quite easily, such as is the road easy to cross? Is it too noisy? Do people feel safe? So the next step actually is then to test these schemes with, with local communities, which is uh, will be a vital stage. So in terms of the, the takeaways from the, the process and, and the findings, uh, we, we identified that streets are absolutely critical to uh, clean and inclusive growth. Uh, we wanted to design streets for people, so we thought, let's not think about modes, let's think about people. This is about communities. They will travel in different ways, and the starting point should be people. Uh, certainly buses, although not the sexiest mode of transport, are a massive part of the solution. So if we can improve uh, bus movements through a town, then that's a good, a good starting point. We need to rethink how we measure success. So currently roads are often, uh, success is measured about how many cars move along them in a given time. It's not measured in how easy it is to get to your local school. So maybe we should start thinking about how we can re-measure uh, that success. And also think about future-proofing our design. So all of our designs went through a, a future-ready process to check against emerging technologies. Uh, some further takeaways then mentioned it before but we'll mention it again because it's very important so stakeholders stakeholder knowledge is absolutely key engage early and often and agree a set uh, of uh, kpis with your stakeholders and, and measure that on a regular basis understand uh, your local identity 
identity and distinctiveness in your local place. It's key uh, to creating successful streets uh, uh, and bring together the different modes. So avoid tribalization, get everybody into a single room. Uh, don't talk to freight separately from cyclists. Find local champions because they're the ones that will, will help you uh, succeed on your project. And I think somebody else said it already today, but be bold, be ambitious, uh, push for the best. So that project is now going through uh, a set of pilot studies and those pilot studies are moving into detailed design and business cases. And at the same time, TFGM are evolving a set of principles and a strategy for people all across the country and a design guide to support that. Okay, I'll hand back to uh, Richard now, who will talk you through our work at Google. Thanks, Danny. So as I believe most of you will be aware, um, the Hull Road Corridor Study um, is, is live now and is looking to complete um, late summer, early autumn. As you can see in the image here, we've got a broad study area outlined in green and the corridor itself outlined there in red. Ultimately, we are seeking to derive a business case for investment into the corridor itself. But how do we do that? So our starting point has very much been around the Chester Transport Strategy and the Chester One City Plan, as well as early engagement with Sean Trainer and his team and Councillor Beecham. Thank you to those people. And we've defined five key start points here for us, supporting a green city vision, improving sustainable travel options, resilience to future trends and technology, a people first approach and creating connected communities or maybe another way of saying that is improving the current connections between communities. I'm going to go to the next slide Danny. So early observations to date from our engagement both with uh, Sean and his team and with Councillor Beecham and also from our site visits. You may recognise the area of course as the approach to the Hull Road Bridge. We've got what we would define as a poor gateway experience. This is essentially um, a route which takes us away from what we would define as the appropriate desire line. We can see that pedestrians are marginalised in this image. There are substandard footways. There's no cycling infrastructure whatsoever. And perhaps as a result of that, development opportunities are not being exploited. Go to the next slide, Danny. As we move further back down the corridor, we can see here that vehicles are clearly dominating the street scene. Um, we've got along the corridor infrequent pedestrian crossings that are perhaps not necessarily sighted on the most appropriate desire lines where people do wish to cross. Clearly, as we can see in the image as well, we've got on street parking, which has been crammed in wherever possible. And what could be an attractive street scene and street setting is not being maximised. Next slide, Danny. Some other things we've found out and noted is there's quite a lot of wide carriageway areas where hatching is used. This is primarily a function of the highway engineers needing to provide or wanting to provide right turn pockets for traffic over the years not necessarily because the traffic turning right is a very high volume, but a way of trying to ameliorate the impacts on the rest of the traffic on the A56. What this does, of course, is create a wider road. It also marginalises and makes side streets car dominated without giving enough precedence to pedestrian routes. And again, Danny, slide on. We've also looked into the accident statistics for the corridor in quite a bit of detail, and we do know there are three or four accident hotspots. Luckily, not involving too many serious or even worse killed incidents. What we have noted is quite a high frequency of accidents involving a vehicle and another non-motorised user, be that a pedestrian or a cyclist or other. We've also noted from speaking to people, again, as I mentioned, Councillor Beecham and Sean and his team, as well as our views of the corridor, is that perception of safety, even when there may not be an amalgamation or an accident hotspot, is equal as important. Members of the Chester Cycling Campaign have pointed out that the Ermine Road and Lightfoot Street Junction, which is very close to the Hull Road Bridge, 
doesn't necessarily have a, an amalgamation of accidents, but is avoided in terms of um, active modes. And there's a perception that it is very unsafe. And we don't want to have areas or locations where people are avoiding them just on the basis of perception. So next slide, Danny. So how are we going to go about exploring solutions? Benchmarking. Essentially, we are not shy of saying that we will look at other approaches that have been adopted elsewhere. Better streets approach. Danny mentioned the TFL Healthy Streets initiative earlier. There are perhaps cities such as Durham and York, whereby they have similar characteristics to Chester, and we can look to those for inspiration perhaps. What this image shows is essentially a um, quick delivery plan for reshaping streets. So it does look like there are five stages, but essentially it is all about achieving change for the street as quickly as is possible. Uh, I won't read each of those now, I'll allow us to go through the next slide. So if you want to move on, Danny. So here we can see a typical street. We've got a lot going on in the street, a lot of interaction, perhaps a lot of reduced or severed interaction as well. But we can see that vehicles are clearly dominating. We can see that pedestrians are perhaps marginalised and we can see that pedestrians are having to share their limited space with a lot of other street furniture. So in terms of the first aspect of our quick delivery plan, tidy up, as is mentioned, um, graffiti and litter, I think, go without saying in terms of their removal. But the first stage is removal of um, non-fixed street furniture. So advertising boards, for example. And you can clearly see there. Number two, we start looking into what we would call declutter. So this is the fixed street furniture, bollards, guardrails, certain aspects of signage, things that have been implemented over years as a way of trying to ameliorate the car dominated nature of the street. So rather than trying to design safety or design um, uh, an all modes approach from the outset, these are features that have been added over time just to try and ensure and prioritize in some ways the existing um, car dominated scene. Number three, merging functions. So we can clearly see here between the two stages, what we've done is relocated signage. So necessary signage in terms of um, traffic regulation orders are retained. Bins are perhaps attached to street columns, so they're no longer isolated or away from, uh, stood in a, an isolated location where pedestrian may um, find they're in the way. And this also gives us scope to look at um, additional things such as planters and things like that, but again, in locations attached to existing street furniture, such as the lampposts. Number four. Moving more into the permanent here, so a chance to rethink traffic management. So as you can clearly see here, we've got new pedestrian crossings. And this is the first stage in terms of thinking about moving away from a car prioritised street. And you can clearly see that is a speed cushion that's been implemented. Recreate the street. This is what some people may have referred to in the past as a shared space, what we might now call a level surface. We can clearly see here that we've got all modes either with equal priority or active modes given a higher priority than traditional car usage on the street itself. This is essentially, as the phrase says there, the transformation of the public realm. And benchmarking in itself, pop up urban design, try before you buy. This is essentially a phrase that we like because what it means is that the, um, to use a technical phrase here, the Traffic Management Act gives the highway authority the ability to implement quite a few measures without having to go down legal processes or legal routes or serious design stages or anything like that that can be tried and evaluated and quite easily removed if necessary, but also can be made permanent if they're a good idea as well. And we refer to this as tactical urbanism. And so to summarise, as we said at the beginning, the COVID-19 opportunity 
urban environments, enabling physical distancing after lockdown, deterring universal car use after lockdown, so returning to the, the norm that we don't want to return to, capturing the benefits of increased home working. And some of the measures here that I'm sure you're all aware of that we can look to implement through the quick delivery plan, so widened footways, narrow carriageways, new boundaries using park, excuse me, sorry, using paint, parklets, for example, reallocation of on-street facilities for um, bi-directional cycleways, reduction of speed limits, 20 mile per hour, perhaps even be bold and down as low as 10 mile per hour, completely closing certain streets and creating play streets, thereby creating streets as a place and a space to enjoy, perhaps looking to reopen pocket parts where they, where they may have previously existed and a place for people to spend time and interact safely with each other. And so there's our final slide. Want to slide on, Danny? Seems to be stuck on this slide. OK, the final slide would say or should show a series of four questions, which we don't necessarily need to go through now, but we'd very much appreciate the feedback in terms of where are your priority areas for inclusivity, health and well-being, and could a streets for all, streets for all approach help? Which existing or proposed investments might benefit from streets for all to magnify its benefits? What does a good street look like to yourselves? In terms of what we've identified today from a streets for all approach, do you anticipate any issues with it? And that's the end of our presentation. That's brilliant. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure people will have a, a lot of conversations, uh, a, a lot of questions. Um, so if we want to go back onto I took a screenshot before probably the most important slide, which was the, um, um, the slide outlining the five main um, aims, um, which was tidy up declutter, merge functions, rethink traffic management, and which is probably quite uh, poignant at the moment, and, and recreate the street. Um, but I'll open it up to members uh, to ask questions, um, and I'll try and keep an eye as best I can on the um, wave function, uh, wherever it's gone now. Uh, but if anybody wants to speak up, um, go for it. Uh, does anybody else want to speak? Um, yeah. It's more of a statement, really, than a question. It looks a lot like the Northgate development if it didn't have an 800 uh, space car park. Hmm? It looks a lot like the Northgate development if it didn't have a huge car park. The right. plan. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't know what you mean. But the, uh, I'm what, saying it, that the Northgate it looks like a car park. I said the Northgate development would comply with it, looks a lot like it, if it didn't have an 800 space car park in it. I think it's a point about the Northgate development, Matt. Yeah. Ah, right, OK. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, any others? Councillor Shaw? Yeah, I mean, I want to first of all thank um, all the officers um, and others that have worked so hard to, to try to bring this to fruition. It's long been an ambition. Um, really hopeful now that with um, further funding announcements that we are able to actually realise our ambition and uh, really see active travel take its rightfully take its place at the forefront um, of everything that we're doing in the borough. So um, nothing further to add, really. I just think it's really good and I'm glad to see it. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, Councillor Holbrook. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think um, having listened to the presentation and need to, a little bit of time to sort of think about um, ab absorbing that, that information and actually how we can all work it for our residents in our, in our own localities, because uh, there will be areas 
that will actually fall into some of these ideas really well and there'll be other areas that would actually would be struggling to um, meet the, criteria, the criteria so um, I think it's a good thing for taking out to our parish councils and our communities and and seeing how they how they uh, how they see it yeah absolutely I think we, we, we have got a probably a once in a lifetime opportunity at the moment for being able to fast track quite a lot of stuff um, for for the greater good um, but you're, you're absolutely spot on there's no one size fits all to any of this um, but as long as we involve people in the process it will be um, I'm sure it will be well received um, Councillor Beecham Yeah I know, I know I'm not on this committee but I uh, I am really really um, interested in this um, scheme I think it's the one of the most exciting things that's going on in the council at the moment um, there's a lot of people on this group that will, I know Paul's comment about the car park is um, a serious point about how he, how he sees it. There are still people that will, will continue to use cars and we are trying to do our bit to uh, change behaviour. And this scheme is the council making a serious attempt to rebalance um, uh, road usage, uh, road space on a key corridor um, into the city to help the communities that live along that um, road to, to find better and safer ways into the city, but also to represent Chester and the way into Chester um, uh, differently as well. We were, some members from Chester were in a, um, uh, the, our localities group uh, just recently, and we were talking about how uh, the lo a long-term vision to try and remove more cars from the city centre and how um, additional use of park and ride in, in key locations would be able to to achieve that. And this this all of this project um, is about re envisaging what people do when they come off the motorway and how they get into the city. Whether that by by bicycle down the greenway, whether it be potentially by a bus service down that road, or whether it be um, riding directly down that road on a on a bicycle as well. And I think. There are so many interesting projects that are already going on along um, that corridor, uh, ending up at the super trees, but um, uh, Alexandra Park's pollinator park, um, some of the work that's been going on in the Narrows, tree planting in um, Limewood Fields, um, the Greenway itself. All of this whole corridor speaks to a, a vision already that just needs to be sewn up into one package that we can all um, get behind. That has enough gravitas that makes uh, people understand the behavioural change that we're trying to achieve. And that, that for me, is what this whole thing is about. It's uh, about packaging something up that's big enough that makes people think actually things are changing and can see the impact of it where they live or, or when they come into the city. And it's really, really exciting. So glad everybody likes it. <laughs> Part of Paul. Thank you. Um, trying to look at the participant list now. Um, if we've got any other members which would like to raise a um, question or a point on uh, what we've just seen, that would be fantastic. Councillor Erdley. Yeah, I have got a couple of. Uh, I've got my. You have to see my terrible beard. Apologies. Um, I've just got a, yeah, a couple of um, observations. Um, I suppose they come here. Um, uh, in terms of active travel, I was just wondering what what level of um, officer support we have around um, around this, and whether there's anybody um, dedicated to um, to furthering the. Uh, the the agenda generally. I appreciate there are a number of officers that have got um, involvement in it, but it strikes me that this is going to be a long term um, long term theme or agenda that we um, should be um, should be pursuing. And I just wonder whether there's scope for um, additional dedicated officer um, support for it, um, um, perhaps. Um, and sort of in that context, um, um, and we're sort of aware, I think, of an increased use of uh, or availability, if you like, of volunteers for. For projects and I just wonder how we can incorporate um, the goodwill and willingness of, of, of volunteers out there to engage in um, in projects um, 
um, such as um, such as this. Um, and I suppose the other point I would ask is it's, it feels all very urban focused. And I suppose as a as a rural member, um, I feel I ought to sort of make a case if I can for how we um, broaden these strategies to um, to our more rural um, areas, and particularly those that um, sit on the um, on the perimeter of, um, of of the big of the big city or um, or our town. So uh, Mollington or Sorgal, for example, um, are uh, villages, um, but they they do um, have a, a close link and connection um, to um, to the urban area, which um, I feel that we sometimes um, just sort of dismiss though not dis not deliberately dismiss them, but uh, we we don't necessarily recognise um, opportunities to integrate them into um, into our overall um, strategies, which would be good because they're generally well connected um, from a from a road um, road and 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 cycleway or um, or or um, pavement um, a, a perspective. So if we could just perhaps bear rural communities, particularly those in the hinterland of of our urban areas um, a little bit more that would be that would be good I think. There are three really good questions I think Will uh, can probably uh, Will Pearson our innovation and strategy manager can probably pick up on the first one with staff capacity um, and then we can go into rural and transport afterwards. Um, I can answer that if you want Will or you can. In terms of staff capacity that's dedicated obviously to the climate emergency declaration, I, I do work um, mostly full time on uh, on supporting this priority. In terms of specific support to active travel, I think that question might uh, be best directed to Sean Trainer, who'd be able to give more of an insight into the staffing uh, support within his service uh, that, that supports active travel and wider uh, cycling and walking support. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Will. Chair, happy to, to come in there. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts there. I mean, it, we haven't got a, a dedicated officer at present, so it, it is a fair, fair question. Um, but it's split between a few people um, in terms of public health. Um, Lydia Orford, who does the active travel forum, um, helps helps out. I've got um, bit parts of officers that help, but I, I maybe have got a thought on that process so we'll take that off offline and maybe have a, a discussion um and uh, a proposal offline and uh, we might be able to sort something and there, something there is going to be a large officer increase in um capacity so maybe that's something that could be tied into one of the posts that's um yeah uh, assigned when it's when it's ready yeah i'll have a discussion on that outside of this so. Meeting. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And uh, with rural, rural and uh, rural transport, yeah. I think you wanted to yeah. expand on. That yeah, I, I think, yeah, it's at, it's at the point. Um, and in terms of active travel and rural transport, we have on the list of, of suggestions for pop up cycleways and facilities, they are coming through on the list. So it's not all sort of city centric. So if, if the member has got any other suggestions for particular areas, by all means, feed them in. Um, gratefully received. We'll, we'll and the, and this this new map that you've created this will, this will be a really active way of people to put their thoughts into it. Um, it will. You to act on. Um, and it's um, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, thank you. If um, I could just if I could just jump in, it's Danny from Broadway Malian. Um, it's really important point actually raised by Simon around the different typologies of, of streets. Uh, you see a lot of. Uh, uh, examples and a lot of, uh, of work being done in urban areas, but, but a lot less so in rural areas. Uh, on, on the study that we did in Greater Manchester, the corridor ran through a number of different rural areas. So we were we were able to look at some solutions for, for those rural areas as well as the urban areas and suburban areas and, and a kind of whole range of different urban typologies. So uh, it's important that you don't just get... Um, uh, Anchored into into urban solutions, you know, there's a broader range of solutions required. Thank you. Cheers, Danny. Um, Councillor Shaw, uh, we've got Councillor Shaw. Uh, Councillor Jill Edwards. No. Oh, um, so I think that's about it. Unless anybody's got any further comments or suggestions to make, I think the priorities and are being picked up by um, the officers. Um, I think the, the main thing at the moment is building on the cycling and walking strategy, which we've already got. Um, we've got 
robust plans into place and then just making sure we make the most of the short term opportunities to um, um, to make up for this horrible virus that we're amongst at the moment. So um, and thank you very much um, indeed for the uh, for coming and do, doing a, a second presentation because um, you came, came along and uh, did one for the advis advisory panel um, and it was just as good. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. No problem at all. Thanks for the invite. You're very welcome. And um, if anybody else has got anything else to say, um, I'll just I'll wrap up. I think Councillor Bowers is it, trying just to come in. Okay. Only briefly on that uh, rural point that the the um, how useful the greenway would be to link up to Molesworth and the old railway line to to Frodham that would connect. Um, tens of thousands of people to save cycling routes, um, you know, in, in one of the, you know, in a very, very busy main arterial routes that people have to cycle on there. Chair, that, just a response on that. that. That request has come through strongly in the LC WIP response, so the, um, that strategy and also the, um, the pop-up measures and, and short-term measures as well. So that, that request's on the list, yeah. And that's included with um, uh, the buses and trains at the same time. It is, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, from a climate reduction perspective, um, is does uh, Georgina Patel have anything to, to add to what we've just heard? And primarily like a, an EV strategy. Oh, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, no, I think Sean and his colleagues have uh, covered most of the issues. Um, and in terms of an EV issue, we're working with the council in terms of installing EV charge points in um, car parks uh, across the borough, uh, council and car parks, and council buildings as well. So, no further questions, comments or questions. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, so that that's it. Um, there's no outstanding business that I know of. Um, the next meeting will be the 23rd of June um, on housing and land use. Um, and the one after that will be the Wednesday, the 15th of July for offsetting and uh, climate repair. Um, but as Councillor Holbrook said before, it takes it sometimes takes quite a while um, to digest um, some of this information and some of the best ideas come come out of after you've slept on them. Um, so um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm assuming uh, Will Pearson will email everybody the presentations and uh, people have to think about them over, over the weekend. And then if anybody's got any further ideas, um, they can forward them to um, climate emergency at cheshirewestonchester.gov.uk. No, no, it's climate, it's climate change. Councillor Bryan, can I just add um, to your yeah. comment there that if anybody's got any further ideas around pop-up um, for pop-ups for walking and cycling, it's transport strategy at cheshirewestandchester.gov.uk. Brilliant. For the time being, I think well, hopefully we'll we'll have a, an email sent out to to all members advertising how to submit and populate the the map that's going to be created as well. I think um, the member briefing went out last um, earlier this week with that on, I believe. Yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Council, yeah. 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 It did. It was. Yeah. I don't you, know. It was parcelled up with two or three others, but it's. Yeah, there is one in the end of last week. Council show. Yeah, that's right. That's brilliant. That's great. Well, thank. Thank you very much. Um, I'll see you all soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.